morning to the book of First Peter, and I ask you to join me in a few passages that I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 13. Wherefore, wherefore, excuse me, gird up the loins of your mind, and be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance. In other words, he's challenging us to grow up and to act right because of the knowledge that he's given us. But, but where I want to really swerve into this morning is verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And that word conversation, as I've mentioned many times, would probably be better translated in our modern times as behavior. It meant more than just speech. It meant how we acted, how we conducted ourselves, and so, so forth. So because God is holy, we need to act and conduct ourselves as people of holiness because it is written... Be ye holy, for I am holy. All this month I felt the Lord say, in the month of August, challenge people's visions that they have of me in their mind. And we started with uh, the great I am. And then I ministered about how great the Lord is and greatly to be praised. And last week we talked about Do we need an explanation or revelation? And this morning, I add to that series of preaching, and I'm just calling it the indescribable holiness of God. The indescribable holiness of God. I believe God wants us to have a fresh revelation of His holiness. Hallelujah. Let's praise Him one more time. Jesus, we love you and thank you. For your blessing and your anointing. And God, I thank you for the ministers that have ministered and those that will be in a little while this evening. And I'm asking you to bless everything that we're doing today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. So the Apostle Peter challenged us to mature and to grow in him. And that a revelation of Jesus Christ should create a, a sober living in us. Not a reckless living. Not a cavalier behavior. Uh, Lord, forgive us for times that we've been more cavalier than we should have. But then he reminds us about the nature of God that we serve. Our God is a holy God. And then on top of the fact that he's holy, he requires holiness from us. And I got to tell you, that's a scary thought. Because as I've been preaching to magnify God in our minds, the one thing I keep saying week after week is we all have a vision of the Lord in our mind. And yes, He's great, but I don't know if we understand how great He really is. That's what I'm touching on today. Do we know that God is holy? Yeah, I believe all of us believe God is holy. But I, I'm not sure we have a revelation of just how holy He really is. And the thought of living up to His holiness is just, well, I'll be honest with you, to me it's terrifying. Because I don't even know, there's no way that it could be done. Uh, As a matter of fact, the only way that it's possible is that there would have to be a divine help on His part. And I tried to think of a way to try to maybe create a little bit of a word picture of uh, th- that shows his holiness and shows our uncleanness in his presence. And I, I had to chuckle because I, I, you know, the older I get, the more uh, things, you know, from when I was younger change. And the younger generation, I, I, I get amused at how many things they can hear us talk about that uh, they just have a quizzical look on their face. And I'll tell you one of them that the younger generation doesn't know much about. But believe it or not, before cell phones, we used to have these things called telephone bills, long-distance bills. Uh, And I know we have a cell bill that comes in now, but for the most part, most of us have a package deal. And you get, you know, you can call wherever, you know, and it's all part of your 
package that you do, but that wasn't how it used to be. As a matter of fact, uh, long distance was a very costly thing at one time uh, in America. And as a matter of fact, it was a serious budget item for every family. It was considered like a utility. And you had to be, you had to be careful. And you'd call family or whatever. I know that there were times I remember my parents and stuff talking when we were younger. And, and we, they couldn't afford to call. Or if they called, only stay on the line for three or four minutes. And because uh, the, the bill's going to come in and we're getting charged so much per minute uh, for these. And then the bill would come in and the long distance calls would be itemized. Every single call that you made was itemized on that bill. And uh, some months you realize you were a little more careless than other months. And, and the, the bill would jump up on you and you'd feel, feel kind of agonizing over it. And it was very costly. As a matter of fact, those, those bills would come in painstakingly itemized. Uh, I mean, we, even the church here, because we were running a business and running the district, and, and we would get you know pages of phone calls and stuff that would come in. And, and another thing they used to have back in those days, they had these 900 numbers. Uh, that, that people would call in for entertainment and, and, and different things. And, and young people would sometimes get ornery and try to get a hold of one of these 900 numbers and not understanding that everything is recorded. I remember one family, uh, even in the church years ago, that uh, confronted one of their teenagers over this. And, and uh, he tried to lie to his parents and tell him, no, 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 I, I didn't do any of that. And then the problem was the bill came in. And it was painstakingly itemized. There was a $500 bill uh, that came in because those, those numbers were not only charged, they were charged like triple time, the normal long distance rates. And, and I, I'm, just, I'm just pointing out that uh, what it was like, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, people would, would try to find a phone in a building sometimes just to sneak in and make long distance calls. Uh, we, we had the problem here at the church. Uh, I remember years ago when this was happening. This is going back in, in the 90s. And I remember getting a phone bill that I about fell off my chair. There were calls to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a foreign country. I can't remember which country it was offhand, but there was a bunch of calls. And finally I talked with the uh, phone company about it, and they concluded that someone had gotten access to our uh, system here. I, I don't even remember how it happened back then. Thankfully, they were gracious enough to uh, believe us that it wasn't us, and they wiped the charges off of the, the thing. But that's how, that's how wild it was. For those of you that are younger, you may not understand, but, but if you ever got one of those bills uh, and you thought in your mind that you didn't talk as much as you think that you did. I didn't do that much. I didn't spend that much time on the phone. But when the bill comes in, uh, it's painstakingly itemized. I, I want every one of us to understand uh, that most of us carry around in our mind an image uh, that, that as we stand before God, that, uh, you know, it's not that bad. You know, I'm not that bad of a person. Uh, but I want you to know the bill comes in uh, and it's painstakingly uh, itemized. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. He said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's going to be so for every one of us. Folks, I got news for you. We are a lot worse than we think we are. And the bill is, un, is painstakingly itemized. I want you to consider in your mind just how terrifying it would be to have to stand before God and to note that everything you've ever done is uncovered. Not only the things that you've done is uncovered, but the unclean thoughts that you had were uncovered. Things that you thought and you didn't, 
you didn't even do or something that you said but you didn't act on but everything nothing is hidden nothing is unseen I I, I would say that most of us are able to function and have a decent reputation because we we know only a limited amount uh, of each other but it's not so when it comes to God uh, he knows everything about us uh, every thought he knows the number of hairs on our head uh, Hebrews chapter 4 says neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight uh, but all things are naked and opened into the eyes of him with whom we have to do I want you to know that's a, a terrifying thought or it ought to be if it's really hitting us right when I recognize that my uncleanness is brought before and standing before His holiness. Until you have seen a right picture of that in your mind, it's hard for us to appreciate just what our real condition is. I want to talk to you this morning about the prophet Isaiah because he had a very similar experience to this. And I'm praying that God will help all of us have a little bit of an experience in this today. But when you go back into Isaiah's life, you notice something interesting. By all accounts, he seemed to be a very successful minister and prophet of his time. God had greatly used him in Israel. Uh, when he spoke, people listened. He had a good reputation and he ministered during the time and the years of King Uzziah, which was a very long and prosperous reign. As a matter of fact, uh, King Uzziah went into the throne at age 16 and ruled Judah for over 52 years. He was the ninth king, and it was a great time of prosperity for Israel because uh, the Bible says that he did that which was right in the sight of the of the Lord. And and that's a that that has that is still true today when it comes to civil government. If civil government will do things and create policy that's generally pleasing to God, God will bring a general peace upon the people. But when there's ungodly leadership, it creates a, 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 a havoc uh, that God can't bless. And by the way, that is the standard of it. it it's, it's not what appeals to us. Uh, it's what is right in the sight of the Lord. That's what's going to be the judgment of it all. Ironically, in Uzziah's later years, he contracted leprosy. And he had to live in a separated house. Even as king and his son Jotham ruled by proxy on his behalf. And when you bring up uh, Second Corinthians, or Second Chronicles excuse me, 26, and I want you to notice <clears throat> what the Bible says. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. Uh, for they said, He is a leper, and Joth Jotham his son hath reigned in his stead. If one of you brethren would do me a favor and find me a water, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but it's, <clears throat> I want you to notice that Isaiah was writing and recording the uh, events of Uzziah's life. And it's within this backdrop that he encountered an incredible experience that was going to change his life. Bring up Isaiah chapter 6. This is a well-known portion of Scripture, but I want us to go back into it again because he writes in this opening verse of verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. I want you to picture with me in your mind, if you will, to try to see what it was that Isaiah saw. Because evidently for the first time in his life, even as a prophet, he was given a, a greater powerful glimpse of the glory of God. He saw the, the throne room itself. Thank you, sir. He saw the throne room. And in that he saw the, the, the glory and the presence of God. And he noted something interesting. In Isaiah's day, it was very common for kings 
that uh, their robes were an expression of their very government because uh, every time they were involved in a war or had a clash with another kingdom and they would win, they would take a portion of the train from the losing king's robes uh, and cut off a portion of it and it would sew it on to the victorious king's uh, uh, robe. So whenever you entered into the presence of any king back in those days and he would put on those royal robes, uh, you could judge the power of his king and the power and the authority of his kingdom by the length of his train and how how long it 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 it, it went because it, it was uh, it meant victory and authority. I, I want you to notice when jo- when Isaiah got into the presence of the Lord, uh, he said, "I saw the Lord high and lifted up, uh, and His train uh, filled the entire temple." I want you to know there is no end to the power and the authority of our. Isaiah noted the train filled the temple. It was a testimony of his matchless power and his matchless authority. It was a power. He was describing one victory after another, one victory after another. And finally, after he noted the train, go to verse 2. Isaiah 6 and 2, he said, above it. In other words, above the throne. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. And above the throne stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And the one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. I want you to picture it in your mind. I want you to close your eyes if you have to, uh, to envision what he was seeing. But above the throne, he sees these seraphims. I want you to picture them in your mind if you can. They had six wings each. The Bible said there were two wings. There were two seraphims uh, that, that he particularly acknowledged, it looks like. And he said they had two wings. Uh, with two wings, they covered their face. And with two other wings, they covered their feet. And then with two other wings, they, they, they flew and continued to circle around the throne. And all they were doing was talking out and crying out to each other, Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy. That's all they were doing. (laughs) I want you to understand, these seraphims were not bungling little trainees like sometimes is shown in movies, and it certainly wasn't these ridiculous little toddler-like cherubs and diapers that you see in Hallmark cards. I don't know where in the world those foolish ideas of angels came from. But I want you to know true angels of God are nothing like that. And he called them in Hebrew seraphims. Uh, And in Hebrew that word seraphim means burning ones. They were like on fire. They radiated with the glory of the Lord. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is, true high-ranking angels are, are terrifyingly awesome to behold. And the voices had such power. Uh, and all they did was fly around the throne crying to each other, Holy, 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 uh, holy, holy, holy. Then the one would yell to the other, Holy, holy, holy. Uh, and then the other would respond, Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> And they would repeat it over and over again. Because in Hebrew, expressions of superlatives and levels of superlatives are expressed in repetition. If you're going to say something is is big, you know, in, in English you'd say, that's really, really big. In Hebrew, you would just sort of say, well, that's big, big. Or if something, if you're describing something that's deep, you'd you say, that's deep, deep. In other words, repetition means superlative. You add it on. That's, and, and it was a similar thing in Greek. 
when uh, you know they would say verily or, or verily verily I say unto you. It had to do with repetition. Meant that it was a a, a higher level of, of 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 superlative. And what's interesting is all throughout the scripture, there's only two times that I'm finding that things were yelled out in triplicate and repeated three times. And one of them was in this atmosphere that Isaiah said that he saw the seraphims crying, Holy, 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 and then the other would react, Holy, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Because holiness, there's a lot of things. We're created in the image of God, and there's some attributes of God that He allowed to come down into us in minute patterns but the one, one attribute that did not extend to us is holiness. We are not holy. He is holy. And the only way we can become holy is if His holiness is somehow immuted to us. So when Isaiah wrote all those years ago about what he saw in the vision... It's interesting to me that the only other portion of Scripture that does the same thing, if you'll bring up the book of Revelation in the fourth chapter, the Apostle John is writing in his vision when God opens up the windows of heaven and he allows him to see into that same throne room that Isaiah caught a glimpse of all those hundreds of years prior. And what he wrote in the eighth verse is the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and which is and which is is to come. What I'm preaching today uh, is that the Apostle Paul saw the same vision that, that uh, Isaiah saw. He saw the same throne room. He saw the same uh, uh, seraphims that were alive with the glory and the power of the Lord. Uh, and the only time in Hebrew that, the, that they used uh, to describe anything in triplicate, uh, it was when they called on the holiness of God. Uh, he is holy, uh, holy, holy. Uh, oh, the angel said, he's holy, uh, holy. Holy, holy, and then again, holy, holy, holy. I want you to understand how holy it is. It's not only said over and over again in triplicate, but they rest not day and night. We know God's holy, but I don't think we understand just how holy He really is. That in Hebrew... It requires seraphims to use the largest expression of three. And that's not even enough. You just have to keep saying it over and over again. They rest not day or night, saying, Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and which is and which is to come. The angels are doing this 24 Seven. I want you to know when this service is done, even right now, right this moment, they're, in, they're by the throne crying, holy, holy, holy. When we're, when we're done later today and, and, and having lunch or whatever as people are doing, uh, I want you to know the angels are still around the throne, uh, the seraphims burning and radiating with His glory. Uh, holy, 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 holy. When you went to bed last night, they were around the throne crying, holy, holy, holy. Uh, it, 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 what I'm saying is, is that there is no language exp- way. It is literally, the holiness of God is indescribable. Because it requires seraphims to say holy, holy, holy over and again, nonstop, forever. Because that's how holy our God is. When Isaiah saw it, bring back, bring back Isaiah 6. He was so overwhelmed. He said in verse 5, he said, and, and, and when he saw this, uh, <clears throat> he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a 
people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is what I'm preaching today. The more of a revelation of God that you get in your mind and the greater revelation of who He is and of His holiness that we get in our mind, it also brings us a greater revelation of our uncleanness and just how lacking we are. See, the problem is with Americans, we're, we're, we're kind of a unique group. We tend to confuse goodness with niceness. And because most of us tend to be fairly nice to each other, that doesn't always mean we're good. As a matter of fact, there was a poll given amongst Americans, and I thought this was interesting, said 90% of Americans that are polled think that they are morally above average. Now, I might point out that's mathematically impossible. <laughs> There's no way 90% of us are morally superior to, to each other. So number one, it's not even possible. But, 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 but the question is, why do we even think that about ourselves? Oh, I, I, I know none of us would say we're perfect, but we all would have a, a limited idea to just what a mess we really are because we're nice. What ends up happening is, is we end up comparing ourselves among themselves, even though the Bible says it's not wise to do it. And, uh, and, and so we end up doing like Paul says, we boast things out of measure. Matter of fact, let, let me read it to you, 2 Corinthians 10 uh, and, and 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Because here's the thing, uh, you will never get a right reading of what you are by comparing it to somebody else. The only way we can get a right reading of what we are is to compare us to Him. And Isaiah stood alone before the throne room of heaven and he cried out, Woe is me! I am lost and I'm undone. He was brought to silence. He said, I'm ruined. This is the same man that had been prophesying uh, in the name of God. This is the same man that God had been using uh, in a mighty way. But he was left uh, standing before the presence of the Lord to realize uh, that even though he had been a prophet all these years, uh, he was nothing uh, in the sight of the king. And that's the real condition of humanity. Just for a little bit of clarity, I want you to know. You know, God struck Uzziah dead one time just because he tried to steady an ark. He turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. He, he killed 70 Israelites one time that, uh, because they, 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 they opened up the ark of the covenant. He, and in the garden, one bite of a forbidden fruit ended up creating an eternal problem for humanity. Uh, and, and, and lest you think, well, you know, that's just God in the Old Testament. He was moody then. No, no. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, it was in the New Testament that he struck Ananias and Sapphira dead in church for lying. Somebody pointed out it's a good thing he hasn't struck everybody dead that's ever lied in church. There wouldn't be much left. Most of us lack the reality that it's, it's God's grace that keeps us alive. Most of us view ourselves as, again, fairly good people, but wickedness is measured against the glory of the one that's rebelled against. And the God that we serve and the God that made us is a holy God. And Isaiah, it was Isaiah that would write later that our righteousness is become nothing but filthy rags in his presence. Isaiah confronted with the revelation of his unclean lips. Uh, everything about him was tainted in his presence. Uh, and, and, and all I'm trying to get to today is I, I'm asking us as a Knack family, do we see ourselves properly in his presence? 
for those of us that think we're doing so good, are, are we even able to make it through the Ten Commandments without getting butchered up? One pointed out that even the first commandment I become guilty of every time I seek my own glory instead of God's glory. So, oh, well, I, I, I haven't committed adultery. Of course, then Jesus expanded the, the battle. He said, but if you think unclean thoughts, you've done it in your mind. And I, who in the world could, could live through that? Let alone lying. Every time I've been untruthful, every time I've ever stolen something, there's... The only thing I can think of that I'm pretty sure I've never done is I can get pretty, well, I never murdered anybody. That's, that's good, yeah. Except Jesus said if you hate your brother, it's like murder. No wonder Isaiah used the term filthy rags. It meant defiled rags. Not just dirty, but they were diseased rags. They were leper rags. Not only could they not clean anything up, just touching them themselves would, would defile whatever it touches. And the revelation that Isaiah caught in the midst of it all was that there's only one thing to do when you are confronted with the indescribable holiness of God. You've got to cry out, woe is me. And you've got to repent and acknowledge I am lost and I'm undone. And I've got to get this idea out of my head that I'm just a nice guy that just needs a little help here and there. No, I'm broken. I'm, I'm nothing before Him. A, a revelation of His holiness shows me a revelation of my uncleanness. And I feel like this morning that we as a church family need to call on the name of the Lord this day. We have been praying and asking God to move across the church and heal sicknesses and let angels visit homes and touch and, and bring an end to this virus that's running around. It's the plague in our whole nation. Now. But what we as a body, I believe, need to do uh, is first of all repent before the Lord uh, and say, God, forgive us for any arrogance that's in our spirit. Forgive us for anything that's in our minds that's just thinking that we're no problem and we're no big deal. Lord, give us a revelation of your holiness today. Let me get a fresh picture in my mind of how holy you really are. Because I have some good news today. The story, thank God, didn't end with him falling apart. But I go to verse 6, Isaiah 6 and 6. Bring it up on screen. Because the moment that he cried out, Woe is me. I am lost and undone. Then, everybody say then, flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. Now, I don't know, you know, if I see an angel flying at me with a burning coal. <laughs> Especially when I just cried out, I'm lost and undone. I'm figuring that my first thought that came to Isaiah's mind is probably, here it goes. It's done now. He's going to just come kill me. The truth of the matter is, that's what should have happened. But instead, the, the seraphim took the live coal that was in his hand and took it with tongs from the altar. Think about that. A burning, the, the seraphim means burning one. Uh, a fiery angel had to pick up a coal off of the altar uh, with tongs uh, because it was too hot to handle for him. And he laid it upon my mouth. And said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Oh, thank God for the anointing of God. Thank God for His grace. You see, here's the point. The same holiness that reveals our uncleanness, uh, or our uncleanness, uh, is the same holiness that can fix uh, our sin problem as well. The same holiness that reveals it. <clears throat> is the same holiness that can burn it from us. Uh, and God does not reveal our sin or our uncleanness to humiliate us. 
<clears throat> but instead he reveals it to us so that we can experience uh, his love and his grace. And I want you to know that all Isaiah had to do was repent and cry out. And it was through no work of his own that he became clean. It was the coal from the altar that burned that stuff out of him in a moment's time. You see, true worship can only come after we cry out, woe is me. And later on, bring up Isaiah 53, famous verses. But I believe Isaiah had a vision and he wrote later about the power of sacrifice uh, because he had seen it firsthand. Uh, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Uh, yet did we <coughs> esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, the chastisement of, his, of our peace was upon him. Uh, and with his stripes we are healed. Look at verse 6. Uh, All we have are like sheep that have gone astray. We have all turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want you to see a fresh image of the Lamb of Calvary that took on the sin of the world. He took our place. Every one of us have fallen short. Every one of us are unclean. But he brought, bought the right for us to stand in his presence without death. Because we can be touched by his glory. We have to stop minimizing our sin and trying to, to, to keep acting like we, we're, we're really just nice people. Uh, no, forget all of that. Uh, we, are, we are much worse than we realize we are. But the good news is uh, God is so much greater than we ever thought he was also. And his love is enough to handle our problems. Uh, that's why in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, uh, bring up verse 14, the writer said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Oh, hallelujah. I feel such a presence of the Lord right now. I wonder if everywhere that you're listening, every home that you're in, whoever's listening online right now, there's a handful of us here. Can we begin to worship the Lord right now? <laughs> Can we just begin to worship Him and praise His name? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and praise Him, church. Just love Him. Oh, Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I call on you right now. I call on your holy presence. God, would you begin to loose angels right now and begin to minister to the household of faith begin to move upon our homes and begin to move upon every one of us no matter who is watching this and from where they're watching or when they're watching. Uh, Lord, let the anointing happen right now as their faith uh, lifts up unto you. Let us cry, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm lost, Lord. I'm undone without you, but I'm asking you, let the angels Take the coals from the fire. Lord, let the blood of Jesus Christ come and fix our sin problem and wash our uncleanness problem. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. What's interesting to me is that after God fixed Isaiah's sin problem, he immediately recommissioned him back into ministry. 
in Isaiah 6 and 8. He said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? And then said I, Here I am. Send me. The point of the message is that we've got to see what our true condition is. We've got to see what our true circumstance really is. Uh, the only way that we can see what we really are is to get into His presence and to get a revelation of His holiness. But understand, uh, when God reveals our uncleanness to us, it is not to make us feel horrible. Stop getting defeated over what we are and start simply repenting and cry out unto the Lord and let Him restore you. Those of you that have fallen away and have backslidden because of times of senses of failure and a sense within you that there's no way you could ever live up to His, His goodness. No, you can't. That's not even the goal. But let Him touch you and let Him bring you back into service. Billy Graham used to say years ago, when we come to the end of ourselves, we find the beginning of God. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think we could just come to the place where, as another man said, when I come to the place where I, I only have God left, I find out God's enough. And that's how I feel this morning. I leave you with one last thing that Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 12. He said, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. I don't preach about our uncleanness to make us feel bad. I'm wanting to see you to see His holiness to see just how much of a mess we really are and then in return see just how great His grace is. That He loves us and He's willing to wash us and cleanse us. And after that, it's time to praise His name. Can we all over this house, uh, all over your homes, in Jesus' name, one more time. Father, we love you and we worship you. I loose this word into the assembly by the authority of Jesus' name. And I'm asking you, Lord, let the people of God have their faith built today. Uh, not, in, not in ourselves, but let our faith be built in your greatness. And in your grandness, there is no situation, there is no circumstance that you, God, are not able to handle, that you are not able to take care of, that you are not able to fix. God, we have taken this entire month to lift you up, and I don't feel that it's an accident that during the same month that we're lifting up to the glory of God that attacks have come in among the body that cause us to question that. Uh, I challenge the church today, put the question out of your mind uh, and get your mind on His glory and His grace uh, because there's no issue we have that His power can't burn. Heal and fix by the authority of Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel his glory. I feel his anointing. <laughs> there's only a few of us that are here in the building this morning, but there's an anointing of heaven that's here. And I pray that same anointing is everywhere that's listening this right now because his glory fills the temple. <laughs> his His. Glory, glory. Fall before Him today. Find a place and reverence Him and repent and let God cleanse us in Jesus' name. God bless you, all of you, in Jesus' name. We'll talk to you soon. Stay connected online. Pray for one another. And uh, we thank God for His goodness. God